one. You just talking to Manoa. El Dorado. Cities of gold. Oh, 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 oh. We're talking cities of gold. What are we talking about, man? Come on, man. We're just talking cities of gold. Oh, you thought it was just a cartoon? You thought we was just over here watching cartoons, man? Let's go, man. Let's go. Let's go. Manoa. El Dorado. I mean, these are maps depicting Manoa del El Dorado. Dorado. Highly questionable this that this cities of Manoa look anything like what we see in the image below, but the mere fact that we have this depiction should be noteworthy. Yeah, this is an actual depiction. What are we talking about, man? What are we talking about, man? City of Manoa. Okay, okay. All right. I mean, at the end of the day, you're just talking about Manoa. This is a Manoa map. Guyana, right? Guyana. We're talking Venezuela. We're talking the River Amazon or the Mar Anon. Love to Mr. Mafioso. You're talking the River Orinoco. The River Orinoco. The river Orinoco. And if you're talking to Amazon and you're talking to Orinoco, then you're talking one thing and one thing only. I mean, come on, man. Come on. Y'all been surfing the wave, a hop to the real ones. To be real means that you are, you know, digging on reality and you're connecting to reality, man. So when we say a hop to the real ones, the home team, the home team means those that are original, you know what I mean? Or at least here to, uh, you know, continue to, you know, maintain and, and, and ether up the original spiral. So you're a real one. You're a home team. Let's go, man. This is the Shabbata. That's the try. We're talking Mount Warema, man. Mount Warema, Sierra Warema, Monte Warema, a giant flat-topped mountain, right? So, you, you know, you got the series where mountains were trees, man. We've been digging on that. Clearly, when you look at this, it looks like a tree that's been just sliced. And now you got to say, man, what type of dracon power, what type of angel power sliced these trees? Remember the Most High said, I will cut down your trees. I will cut down your trees, man. All right, so... Giant flat top mountain, Mesa, Pacorama, mountains of Guyana, highlands at the point where the boundaries of Brazil, Venezuela, and Guyana meet about nine miles long, nine hundred nine thousand feet high. It is the source of many rivers of Guyana and the Amazon and Orinoco River systems. Mount Warema is the highest point of Guyana, man. We're talking about this tree, which we started coining the tree of life. Because, uh, you know, I dare you to tell me anything different when it's the source of the Amazon and the Orinoco. And you remember what Columbus said about the Orinoco. He said, this river seems to be flowing out of terrestrial paradise. We're just talking Eden, paradise. So if this river is flowing out of paradise, and if the source of this river is this tree, why not? Why not see clearly and know that you're talking the tree of life? Or you get another tree, you find yourself another tree that's the source of these such mighty, infamous rivers connected to terrestrial paradise. Bring me another tree for the equation. <laughs> you know what I mean? But for now, this clearly seems to be connected to a tree of life. We're talking Manoa of El Dorado, man. And, you know, these are maps. And, you know, whether the city looks like this, we're just saying that there's something going on inside of this tree. There's something going on, man, inside of this tree again. This is the Manoa, right? This kingdom of Manoa map. This is supposed to be a map, you know, concerning Manoa. You see Manoa right here. And you see the river Amazon here and the river Orinoco here. So, you know, you're just talking to Mount Orima. Let's keep going. I mean, let's back it up, actually. 
Let's back it up, man. We're just talking Guyana, the Mar, like the Mar and Nam. We're talking Mar del Nord. All right, so now they call the uh, Atlantic Mar del Nord at this particular time. All right. Once again, we get into mysterious 17th century. Remember, this is we're just talking about cities of go oh 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 and headless people. <laughs> All right, man, cool, cool. Yeah, man, you just talking about your cities of go, right? California, go, rush, right? The Americas, let's go. We're talking about mysterious 17th century, that's 1600s. Weird terrestrial alterations pertaining to the 1600s. Could things like that be related to this world being somewhat different during the antediluvian times? Before the flood, well, some say, there's myths saying that when this tree fell, when when Rima, when Rima fell, you know what I'm saying? It created this in incredible flood. So, you know, this is also connected to a flood story with some called mythology. All right. Let's go right here. You're talking about a city that vanished without a trace. Huh? Lac Parime is a legendary lake located in Lake Parime all right, in South America. Reputedly, the location of the fabled city of El Dorado, right? We're just talking cities of gold, cities of gold, cities of gold, also known as Manoa. So when I say Manoa, I'm just talking El Dorado. When we see these maps <clears throat> popping out and they got El Dorado, all right? And it's within this tree, Rorima. <clears throat> and they're just saying that inside this tree, inside this tree, in the 1600s, they believe that inside this tree is the cities of gold, or at least one of the cities of gold. You did. Let's get it from here. Much sought after by European explorers, repeated attempts to find the lake failed to confirm its existence, and it was dismissed as a myth. Our brothers say, why are you digging on mythology? Because it's being dismissed as a myth. So everything's being lumped into myth and dismissed. So we got to reverse the curves, dig in mythology and get the drop to take out that stuff that was just dismissed, discarded. We got to get the purified substance. The search for Lake Parim led explorers to map the rivers and other features of South Venezuela, North Brazil, and Southwest Guyana before the lake's existence was definitely disproved <laughs> in the early 19th century. Definitely disproved, really. Okay, take their word for it. Let's go. Some explorers proposed that, proposed that the seasonal flooding of Rapuninu, or Nuni, Savannah, may have been misidentified as a lake. Recent geological investigations suggest that the lake may have existed in northern Brazil, but it dried up sometime in the early 18th century. Didn't they say that the uh, San Banyan River dried up? And what was that, the same year that the Byzantine Empire fell in 1453? They say the San Banyan, you know, disappeared. All these incredible flows supposedly being dismissed, dismissed as a myth. But Manoa and Parim are believed to mean big lake. Mm, big lakes, cities of gold. Mm, okay, rivers of gold. You know, let's put it all together. Let's put it all together. All right. An additional theory is that Lake Parim did actually exist and was drained abruptly in June 1690 when an intensity nine violent earthquake opened a bedrock fault forming a rift. All right. So they said it went underground, just like a lot of the Anasazi and the Ho Ho Kong, you know, four corner situation. Let's get it from here. Right. Sir Walter Raleigh began the exploration of the Guyanas in earnest, in earnest, in 1594, and described the city of Manoa, right, or El Dorado, which he believed to be the legendary city of El Dorado, as being located on Lake Parim, far up the Orinoco River. Orinoco River. Oh, Orinoco River. Got you. 
and the Amazon are sourced <laughs> in Mount Roraima. This mighty tree. We're about to get into it, man. We're about to get into it. We're about to catch another episode of Cities of Gold. This is a beautiful flow. We're putting it all together. All praise our creator. A hop. A hop to all the tribe digging on the pertinent recon, man. This is the wave. This is the third wave. We're just talking third wave. Can't talk third wave without talking to Orinoco flow. So you can get, you know, more drop on what's popping. It says, according to Riley, the lake itself was the source of the gold. The lake itself is the El Dorado. But we also know there's a city connected to this thing, right? Because they're mapping out entire cities. Not cities, excuse me. Kingdom, right? Kingdom. All right. So you got this link. You pull it up. A lot more map drop is connected to this for us to dig on. You know what I mean? This is a beautiful series we're in. We're calling back all the great series along our path, along our journey. All right, so as a result of Walter Wiley, Riley's work, maps began to appear depicting El Dorado and Lake Perrine. One of the first was the Elder Jadakas Andias. Uh, you pronounce it, you pronounce it, published 1598. His map depicted elongated Lake Parim south of the Orinoco River, with the majority of the lake positioned south of the equator, and with Manoa on the northern shore towards the eastern half of the lake. Manoa is the, is noted as the greatest city in the entire world, man. The greatest city in the entire world. I mean, you're talking that avatar drop, right? I mean, you're talking about entire cities connected to your giant trees. All right, all right. You can get this, uh, pull up this link as well. This is in the JCB library. Lake Perrine, right there. Manoa. Now, before we get to, uh, you know, check out some drop, you know, just some good visuals on Mount Rorema. We know we're talking about Manoa. Right, El Dorado. It's a book called The Devil Tree of El Dorado. Love to Chef Candy, who read it. I believe she finished this entire book, man, live in the ether. Man, we got some great sisters and brothers reading these books live on the radio at 432thedrop.com. So make sure you dig on it. We're getting updated, everything's getting revamped. So stay patient with us. AI. It says, During the following days, Elwood and Templemore learned much of, of the strange land in which they found themselves, of its people. So they're over here doing an exhibition in this book, all right? <laughs> I mean, you you connected. You, if you never heard of it, you know, it's probably not a drop in here. The Devil's Tree of El Dorado, pull up the link. Yeah, man, they're doing, you know, missionary invasions, all right, into this tree, into this area. And let's, you know, get a couple drops of what they're finding in this, in this Mount Rorema, Orinoco, Manoa, El Dorado. Now it says... Strange land in which they found themselves, of its people, their condition, other details, but since to give every separate conversation, incident, or other means by which they gain their information would be tedious, it would suffice to cite some extracts from Templemore's diary that sum summarize the knowledge then and subsequent, sub sub subsequently attained. I am now able, I am able now to jot down some account of this strange place and its inhabitants so far, at least as my limited knowledge of this language and other means of information go, the people seem to be amiable, fairly intelligent. So he's finding people, he's finding a kingdom, right, inside of this tree. Let's go. Considering, of course, that they know nothing of the great world outside and generally well disposed, although they maintain a small force of, quote, soldiers or guards and drill and, di and discipline them, with as much assiduity, assiduity of as though they might be called upon to engage in warfare. So they were getting trained up. They, they were getting suited up. They weren't over there just chilling, just, you know, eating pomegranates all day. All right? Yet, as a matter of course, there are no people with whom they can go to war, nor is there any likelihood of their having to fight except among themselves. 
And this, unfortunately, has not been unknown. Moreover, has not been unknown. So there have been inner fights. There have been inner wars even, you know what I'm saying, among these people, man. All right. Moreover, there are signs in the air that it may not be unknown again. So it might be a war coming up. They might be getting trained up to a different frequency. They might have some static popping off, man. An unexpected discovery we have made is that this mountain is connected with another close to it called Merlanda. So you're going to see that Mount Marema is just one of the what they call tepuis or tree stumps. You dig? There's more. Marema is just one of them. All right. The condition or the connection is underground in the roots. These are trees. They're connected in the root. All these caves on the ground are tree roots, man. Mighty tree roots. That's why they're already, they don't really have to dig these caves. They're already there. They're the roots of the tree underground. They're living in the tree underground sometimes. The connection is underground and was made originally in the course of mining operations. Yeah, okay. Okay, let's go. Undoubtedly, once these people were a great nation, their arts and scientists, their buildings, man. Remember all the land of Mu talk with with the cities of gold and Tao and Esteban, all right? Their arts and sciences, their buildings, their engineering works, their knowledge of mechanics. You remember all this high technology Tao's talking about? All give evidence of this, but since a nation isolated as this has been for ages, but necessarily either progress or retrogress, the Minoans slowly, gradually, but surely have done the latter. They have numerous museums, which are full of wonders of all sorts, pointed to all lost arts, lost scientists, lost inventions, lost knowledge of all kinds. So they're warring with each other because they lost something, man. Something was lost, man. The fact that the demand has fallen off with diminishing population has led to the discontinuance of manufacturers, though in the museums there are evidences that they once existed. This is the case as regards chrono, chronometric instruments, their occupations being desultory. They have little need to know the time of day. They, they ain't even on the clock, man. There's even even in a lower state, they're not on that time shit. So the use of clocks and watches has gone out of fashion. And there does not now exist a person in the two islands, as they still call these two inaccessible mountains. These are islands in the sky, trees, all right? Floating islands, right? Who can make a watch or a clock? So there's not one person who can make a clock or a watch because that got nothing to do with them. Nothing to do with them. Yet in their museums, they have many ancient specimens of clocks and watches of various kinds. So, you know, maybe they, you know, had more connection with this, you know, particular, you know, situation. But now they off the clock. Now, is that them going? Is that them retrogressing? You know what I'm saying? Or are they progressing? You know what I'm saying? So we're just taking the hijacks word for it to say, OK, they they retrogress. They they went down. But. This is just their observation, you know what I mean? So were they on the clock? At what point were they on the clock? Or do they just have, you know, the knowledge of the clock and the times and they had that in the museum? It don't mean that they were really adhering to it. You know, it's all kind of questions around that. Like remarks apply to many other arts and scientists and manufacturers. The cause is likely to be found in the fact that they're non-intercommunication with other nations. But the most wonderful thing of all now, hold up, hold up. Also, keep in mind the whole Wakanda situation. This is why we say and we're saying this whole Hawaka and the Hawakas, all this is being found in Peru. Just look up Hawakas, all right? H-U-A-C-A, which is their Waka, Waka, all right? <laughs> Shout out to Waka Flocka, you dig? But these Hawakas are all indigenous. You see what I'm saying? Hawa, 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 Hala, Hawa, the Hawakas. Now, they're living in this place they have to fly through this mountain to get to this beautiful kingdom where are they getting that from same thing here you got to go into this beautiful mountain to reach this place that they have no communication with the outside nations which is the whole situation with the vibranium and can we use our technology to help you know what i'm saying these these uh 
you know, Negroes out here in a sad state of disregard. We got some, our people are in a sad state, right? So can we help our people? Can we free our people with this technology, you know, or should we just stay, you know, non, you know, non, con, you know what I'm saying, non-connected, you know, non-intercommunication, you know what I mean? But the most wonderful thing of all in this land of marvels, listen up, is a plant or herb they call the plant of life. So I'm not tripping when I'm calling this the tree of life if it has, it contains the plant of life. Now, this tree is the source of the Amazon and the Orinoco, Guyana River systems. All right. We're going to see this water flowing and you're going to be able to have a great visual coming right up. But, you know, again, tree of life. Now you got the plant of life. This, I am sure, though it seems hardly credible, if taken from time to time in certain forms, combined with other plants here, in, induces great longevity. So this is not just, I mean, when they say tree of life, plant of life, when you talk about the tree of life, you're talking about the fountain of youth, man. You're talking about living waters, man. You're talking about priest king Presta John, man. Now look up, check it out. Induces great longevity in the recipients. The king, oh, they got a priest king, let's go. The king, for instance, who looks between 50 and 60 years of age, I am surely told, seriously told, is 340. Who, oh, who is Prester John? So they got a priest king connected to this fountain of youth or this plant of life, this water. And their king, who looks 50 or 60, is really 340. Yet that even is nothing out of the way here for assuming that they speak the truth. There are among the priesthood, which is talking priest King Khans, a few who have lived in the land 1,000, 1,500 and 2,000 years or more. Remember, we were digging on the founding youth and it said that Presta John and his whole tribe took six baths in the founding youth. And even if they were a thousand years old, they would turn back to the age of 32. So by the time this person seen the seen the con, he looks about fifty or sixty. But he's already taken multiple baths in the fountain of youth, and even now it's three hundred and forty years old, looking fifty or sixty. I should scarcely take the trouble to write this down, where it were it not that I find it a matter of such common belief on all sides that it is impossible to avoid regarding it seriously. In other words, this. Ain't no play play. You ain't talking about no play play here, man. Let's let's skip down a bit. Now that we know we're talking, and you know, it goes further into naming the plant. I think they call it a Karina, a Karina plant or something like that. And I said, all right, man, we got we got to take some notes, man. So definitely uh, get this get get this document because I'm sure it's gonna have some drop in there, man. That you might want to recon one day. You might want to recon. Hold up, man. Hold up, man. No, man. I just saw. I thought I just saw some other drop, man. On these, there's some dragon drop in here too, where they said they saw a whole nest full of dragons. It was a big leathery. These leathery wings flew over them and stuff like that. So they definitely are seeing dragons up here. They call them uh, pterodactyls, right? dinos, but we know we're talking dragons. We know we're just talking about the rhyme of force. Manella and Elwood at his head was making his way slowly along the tunnel-like road they had cut through the heart of Roraima Forest. So we're just talking the tree. We're just talking the tree. Let's keep going here. I mean, they, they saw jaguars, you know what I mean? They called them pumas. All right, we're just talking about the Black Panther. There's so much drop in this thing, man. Hey, I began to the to my Yapa wife, man. She really uh dug in on this. Really dug in on this. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. So they're over here in this tree, right? This El Dorado. This Roraima. And they started seeing things start lighting up, you know what I mean? When the 
when the lights went off. On all sides, high and low, small lights were seen. They were of various colors and hung, some sin singly, some in groups and clusters. Many drooped over the water and were reflected in the pools below. The effect was extraordinary. The place seemed a veritable fairyland. Didn't we just say, think about Avatar when you think about this whole Orima situation? All right, you got the cartoon called Up. Up did a whole thing about, you know, going to this, you know, special remote island in the sky, floating island, which is the same island, Mount Orima. The place seems a veritable fairy land. Fairy, we did the translation on that, and you can connect the fairies with the dragons, you dig? An exclamation of astonishment and admiration burst from each of them while he stood and gazed upon the scene. Then they went out to the nearest lights and the marvel was explained. The bell-shaped flowers that had excited their curiosity during the afternoon all glowed with radiance. Just like Avatar, the whole forest is glowing, glowed with radiance. Inside, each was a small projection, apparently a fungoid character that was phosphorescent. The whole force is phosphorescent. It sent forth a light nearly as bright as that of a firefly, and this illuminated the bell-shaped bosom bl or blossom, which then appeared of different hues according to its coloring by daylight. Even those that Elwood had picked and thrown down at the entrance of the cavern glowed with appreciable glimmer. I've heard of some kinds of toadstools and fungi being phosphorescent, Templar remarked, or Templar remarked, but never of such a thing in flowers. Yet, observed Monella, if you come to consider the matter, there is nothing more remarkable in the one case than in the other. So, I mean, you saw everything start lighting up, everything turned bright. It's a beautiful scene. Let's get one more excerpt, man, before we you know, jump into a couple of short documentaries. You know, and we, you know, I just want to see this water, man. I just want to see the water flowing. You know, hopefully we can stumble on this dragon drop that's in this, this document as well. But I just want to show you it's real. So whether we're talking about Ramo or Manoa, there's, you know, these type of sources, you know, they might, you know, call them illusions, magical illusions, and all these things. But, uh, you know, they've been dismissed into mythology and Again, Columbus is calling the Orinoco, you know, that it's flowing from terrestrial paradise, man. So he's calling it connected to paradise. We say, where is the source of this Orinoco? And it's this tree called a floating island or island in the sky, which we see as a cut off, cut down, sliced tree like so many others. And we know we're, we're talking about a mighty tree. The Piedmont Indians called it a mighty tree stump. The Piedmont Indians called this tree a mighty tree stump, not a mountain, a mighty tree stump. So we know we ain't, you know, on no play play. Oh, man. Oh, I know it's some drop around. Oh, hold 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 on. Hold on. Man, I mean, look, man. Metallic looking material that glistened in the sunlight like masses of gold and silver. He's seeing this at the bottom of this uh, cannon within a cannon, within the mountain, within the tree. And other places were veins of jasper, porphyr porphyry, and some analogous rock that sparkled and flashes and flashes though embedded with diamonds. I mean, this is what, you know, this is what they seen. All this in the vicinity of Roraima. Roraima. Wow, okay. I feel like Dragon Drop is nearby there, but I'm, I'm not even going to, I'm not even going to take the bait right now. <laughs> I'm not going to take the bait right now. Let me see. It's something else I wanted to point out on. Let's see, page 63. Let's go back here. I'm not going to take the bait because I'll be digging all day in this document here. So lace would drop. Lace would drop. We got to stay focused. I'll get the dragon drop later. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. 
He said, I think our work is at an end. Then they came upon a stream, presumably the same that they had seen that they had been in measure followed through the wood rushing and tumbling in a rocky bed for they were going up rising ground and splashing and foaming in its leap from rock to rock. The trees became still sparser and, and the light stronger till finally they emerged in an open space and saw rising straight up before them the perpendicular flat rock that formed the base of Rorima's lofty summit. Mount Rorima's lofty summit. It was here, fairly light. Indeed, a single ray of sunlight played upon the splashing water in the little stream, and they sprayed, and the spray sparkled in the gleam, but still very little sunlight ever, ever entered the place. The great wall of rock that reared itself in a plum-like 2,000 feet into the sky overshadowed it completely on the uh, on one side and on the other were the great trees of the prime, primeval force towering up 300 feet or more and extending their branches above almost every almost uh, across almost to the rock through below though below the nearest trunk was quite 50 yards away they stood, in fact, upon the edge of the semicircular clearing that extended for the distance of perhaps 100 yards, its radius being 50 yards if taken from the center of the exposed portion of the cliff. At each end of the space, the trees and undergrowth closed in again upon the rock in an impenetrable tangled mass, denser and darker even than that through which the explorers had been slowly cutting their way. Some of the Indians were grouped. Round the stream, two or three enjoyed the luxury of wading in it or sitting on the banks and dangling their feet in the cool water. So they had Indian guides taking them through this. And even in these you know, documentaries, they're going to show these Indian guides, you know what I mean, that's supposed to have been here for so long that we know that they're not, you know what I mean, the original flow. Same thing as when we, you know, dug on the Chumash, right? And how they're pretty much holding, they're the gatekeepers for all this drop, man. All this drop connected to Mu, they're holding, you know, as, you know, ancient sacred artifacts, but they don't know who did it. You know, saying that they, they can't really give you no information. Somehow they just got there and somehow it's their land now. That's all we know, right? That's all we know, right? So we're going to get more out of this document, The Devil Tree of El Dorado, man. Let's just, uh, you know, have a good time in this. See, we got here, surf the wave a little bit and get some great visuals on this mighty tree stump, this cities of gold. We're talking rivers of gold. We're talking cities of gold. We're talking Venezuela, Rorema, Orinoco, Amazon, Marana. Let go. For centuries, legendary rivers of gold and fields of precious stones have lured explorers and uh oh, right away. We're just talking about Venezuela's ancient Tapui. Tapui is the, you know, flat top mountains in the sky. All right, so right away, we talked about rivers of gold, cities of gold, rivers of gold. Let's go. Let's take it from the top. Let go. Come on, come on, man. Come on, man. Come on, man. Now they just. You can find really good. Now they want to sell you on some grammar correcting device. <laughs> Let go. And among those rocks dwell mysterious creatures more ancient than the dinosaurs. For centuries, legendary rivers of gold and fields of precious stones have lured explorers and adventurers here. Located in the southeastern corner of Venezuela, this Eden is a vast group of plateaus known to the local people as Tepuis. Mount Roraima is a giant flat-topped mountain located where the boundaries of Brazil, Venezuela, and Guyana meet. It exists in isolation, 
a misty summit cut off from the surrounding landscape by sheer, breathtaking cliffs. This giant block of sandstone is called a tepoi, and it stands in one of the least known regions on Earth. And here, in gullies and crevices, among tortured rock shapes, strange animals and plants found nowhere else on Earth cling precariously to life. When in turn and his party reached the top, they entered a surreal world. The explorer wrote about it in his journal. All around us were rocks, seeming to defy every law of gravity. Countless caricatures of faces and animals and unexpected objects. The landscape on the summit of Roraima has not changed since Intern's ascent nearly 120 years ago. In fact, it has probably changed very little in the last million years. But the only dinosaurs he found in this lost world were these fantastic prehistoric structures made of stone. Imtern was exhausted and his party had run out of food, so they only stayed on the summit for a few hours. But during that brief time, Imtern realized that the plants and animals surrounding him were unlike any he had ever seen before. The bleak, windswept plateau was a paradise full of exotic plants and flowers. But they all had something in common. There were varieties of plant suited to a harsh and ancient environment. Hmm. Old school, huh? Among them, he discovered several species of carnivorous plant, including the sinister insect-eating pitcher plant. Even if there were no dinosaurs, in turn realized that this truly was a lost world, one worthy of further investigation. Spectacular sinkholes like these on the Tepui called Sabe Sabe Na. Wow. Call that a sinkhole. I call it a dragon lair, man. Could now be seen. Each of the 300 meter wide holes contains an isolated miniature forest, home to many unique species. Unique, unique species. observation by those who set foot on Tabuis, even among the local people, one feels oppressed like an intruder in a hostile place. <laughs> At the top of the mountain, there are vast rivers stained gold by plant tannins. Adrian suspects that these rivers of gold may be what convinced Angel to attempt a landing here. Adrian reflects mm. on his predecessor as he makes his way towards the world's highest waterfall, Angel Falls named after the man who first discovered it. Or we're just talking dragon flow. Dragon flow. Here on the top of Devil Mountain, I have a strain. See? So we just read out the devil tree of El Dorado. Because what they call devils, just like Christianity, they're calling the dragon the devil, right? Well, we know that the fox plays the part of the serpent in the indigenous truth, the indigenous flow, so you're talking about the dog, that's the devil. The sinusophilus, that's the devil. Not the dracon. Not when you're seeing clearly. Eerie feeling of time standing still. This place really does feel lost in time. No time.